Hi, my name is Hannison Cabbage, and I'm a senior writing and linguistics major at Georgia Southern University with a concentration in rhetoric and composition and a minor in economics. Welcome to Redefining Normal, Textual and Visual Rhetoric of Women with Disabilities, my project on the intersectionality and representation of women's bodies with disabilities in the forms of textual rhetoric and visual rhetoric of still image advertising. I know that this form of a video isn't typically what you expect for a complicated project that has fancy words like intersectionality and visual rhetoric, both things that we're going to talk about and are actually really cool, but I've chosen this form because these ideas and topics are important and affect every single one of us. That means that in order for us to comprehend and utilize them, the concepts have to be accessible and put into words that we understand. That includes using American Disability Association accessible fonts and captions so that people with impairments can access this form that is directly about them. This video also serves as an easier introduction of theories and concepts in plain language that will be the groundwork and context for the rest of the series. The goal is that you find this engaging and interesting rather than confusing. This project is filled with interdisciplinary theories and frameworks. But first, let's define exactly what disability is and who are considered to have disabilities. The American Disability Association, or ADA, defines a person with a disability as someone who has a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activity. The field of disability studies holds that disability is a political and cultural identity, not just a medical condition and that it is rooted in society's perceptions of disability itself. Increasing positive representation of disabled bodies is important because it will inevitably affect every single person on Earth in some form. According to the United States Census Bureau, one in five Americans are disabled, and more than 375,000 Americans become totally disabled every year, meaning that a physical or mental impairment limits major life activities. It is not inevitable that we will become disabled, but the potential is certainly there. As one of my mentors put it succinctly, you can't change your race or your ethnicity, but you could become disabled tomorrow. Cornell University further proves this, reporting that in countries with life expectancies over 70 years of age, people spend an average about eight years or 11.5% of their lifespan living with disabilities. So society's norms and representations will directly affect us all. This creates a continuum of disability since it is not linked to any single health issue or condition. And we could so easily go from abled to temporarily disabled or permanently disabled. Usually we see disability as a binary or something that has two parts. Either you are disabled or you are not, which is extremely limiting for all bodies. But by increasing positive representation, we are able to reduce the binary between abled and disabled and see disabled bodies as normal. So instead of seeing them as separate and different, they are just bodies. Ability is transitory and brief, but consideration for the human body lasts for a lifetime. But let's talk about that binary for a second, because society likes to create this distinction. It's normal to think of someone as either abled or disabled and to see these groups in very strict ways. In the book Disability Rhetoric, Jade Homage, who is the founding editor of the Canadian Journal of Disability Studies, notes, the rhetoric attached to disabled bodies inherently makes them seem negative and undesirable, while the rhetoric attached to abled bodies is positive. People are unknowingly upholding this binary, and the only reason why this is possible is because of the power that disability rhetoric maintains and represents. There's a clear power imbalance in society that favors abled bodies, as shown through the lack of representation of bodies with disabilities in media, through older buildings that are not accessible to those with disabilities, and through the negative language attached to bodies with disabilities. Project researcher at Abo Academy University, Carolyn Alvik Harju, describes the effect that the cognitive process of normalization has on the personal experience, noting that our bodies and the stories we tell about them are shaped to fit the standard bodily form and functions. Disability doesn't fall within that standard. Societal pressure and power to isolate and reject disabled or abnormal bodies affects and alters how society perceives the real and physical bodies that they encounter daily. 
the textual and visual rhetoric in the forms of images, words, movies, and advertisements represent how society actually views the bodies that it portrays. Obviously, this binary is complex because we don't live in these normalized boxes of either abled or disabled. We don't want to exist in a state of either or that the binary creates, but many people struggle with it. One solution is to redefine what our normal is. The act of normalizing can lead to inclusion by incorporating bodies into areas that they have previously been restricted from, like adding wheelchair ramps outside of buildings or having models with disabilities in magazines. By making these standard instead of unique, the bodies are better integrated into society. If one model with a disability was used for every model without one, our expectations of models will begin to include bodies with disabilities. The issues that come about is that more often than not, bodies with disabilities are not pictured, staged, or given the same consideration as bodies without disabilities. Here's an example. Here we have the foreground and background. There's no interaction between them, and the woman in the wheelchair is the active aspect as she does a trick staring straight into the camera. The women in the back have literally no interaction with her, and the two on the edges are even closing their eyes. So right here we have a binary, a definitive separation of us and them. The model, her name is Samantha, is not being treated like the more normal bodies standing in the back. So even though this ad is technically inclusive, it's not normalizing disability. Disability is still definitively separate. Samantha not only has a disability, but she is also a woman. So now that we've talked about binaries and the able disabled labels and their power, it's time to really dig deep and talk about another overwhelming kind of power, the patriarchy. Feminist thinking and theory try to understand gender inequality and imbalances by resisting present societal power structures. In this section, I will be using the term woman, I understand that this term is limiting and does not encompass groups of people this affects, including non-binary and feminine presenting queer people, but I am using this term in order to be generally understood. In her groundbreaking book, Bodies That Matter, philosopher and theorist Judith Butler writes, sex not only functions as a norm, but it is part of a regulatory practice that produces the bodies it governs, that is, whose regulatory force is made clear as a kind of productive power, the power to produce, demarcate, circulate, differentiate the bodies it controls. Everyone, including the women themselves, works to regulate what women do and how society treats them. The power of gender roles limits what women think they can do, in turn limiting what they actually do. Because gender roles have been constructed by our society, Women must fight to normalize many roles that they take. So both women and people with disabilities are put into separate spaces in order to control them. And this is seen as socially acceptable, normal even. Societal and patriarchal power is methodically confining these bodies and limiting their ability to thrive. But what happens when a woman is disabled? Intersectionality happens when identities overlap to create complex systems of discrimination or disadvantage. This term was coined by Kimberly Crenshaw for the purpose of law, who said that intersectionality was a prism to bring to light dynamics within discrimination law that weren't being appreciated by the courts. Remember that this project is incredibly complex, so instead of looking at just women or just disability, we need to look at their combined effects that occur because of societal pressure and power. It's important to note that intersectionality is not the actual identities coexisting within the same person, but the discrimination that comes from this intersection. This concept is instrumental in my research as I delve into the language and distributed images attached to disabled women's bodies. An example of intersectionality affecting a disabled woman's body is Nafisa Kanbai, an Asian woman living in Kenya and disabled from a spinal injury. Kanbai describes her life in her article, Dear Diary, The Story of a Disabled Asian Woman, where she faces discrimination from her family, teachers, and the general population of Kenya. This article takes the form of self-representation, showing that societal controls and power structures are not just outside influences. Kanbai addressed this, admitting, Thus rejected, I realized that I had no real choices to make. They'd all been made for me the moment I turned out disabled. 
I realized that the mindset problem is not really personal, but universal in my cultural setup. No matter Kanbai's personal abilities, her culture was set up to constrict her, to control her, based upon her intersecting identities. Her disability limits both what she can physically do, as well as what society expects her to be able to do. Being of Asian descent in an African country separates her from the general population, making her a minority and an outsider. Her gender limits her future prospects, like the fact that her father did not allow her to pursue a degree. That's not what women do, but that's especially not what women with disabilities do, because they assume she did not have the physical ability to excel. By noting these discriminations and where they come from, we are resisting the power that is exerted by the societal norm. Through feminist theoretical critique, Pamela Cooper White explains that feminism involves critical analysis, public advocacy, and community organizing around concrete manifestations of oppression of women. Control only works if you allow it to, and through feminist theory and acknowledgement of oppression and discrimination, we can break those gender roles, controls, and societal pressures that have existed for so long. Representation is the depiction of a likeness of someone or something through increasing representation of disabled women's bodies in images and media, we will be able to normalize the bodies so that they are not sequestered to the spaces that some people think they should stay in. Again, we're trying to dissolve that binary between abled and disabled and the power that it wields so that we can normalize all bodies rather than oppress and discriminate. Visual rhetoric is the ability to analyze how images, both moving and still, make arguments. Looking through this lens allows us to read images and get meaning beyond what's simply shown. Sonia K. Foss asserts, once an image is created, it stands independent of its creator's intentions. By looking through a theoretical lens, we can apply other theories like intersectionality and feminist theories to determine meaning for our culture and society. And by analyzing the visual rhetoric and its approaches of an advertisement, we can consider the cultural repercussions. In terms of advertising, in effects of women representation and advertising on customers' attitudes, Helena Stankovic et al. write the effects that advertising has on society, saying, not only does advertising stimulate purchasing of products and use of services, but it also contributes to the consumer's formulation of the social identity frequently influencing both their current attitudes and what they should be. In that way, advertising exerts power over the bodies that we see and the way that they are represented in order to influence how society sees and reacts to similar bodies that they encounter in their everyday lives. Stankovic et al. continue writing, through perfectly set images, advertisers strive to create a virtual reality and oppose the idea of what is considered normal in society in its entirety. So if in the media that you consume, the only thing you see is women who are perfectly proportioned, that's what you expect to see everywhere. Unfortunately, our society is not composed of only this type of body, but this is our society's perception of normal. That is why representation of bodies with disabilities is so important. The way that we look at images and the mindset that we look at them with directly affects how we interpret them. Sonia K. Foss asserts that there is a set of conceptual lenses through which visual images become knowable as communicative or rhetorical phenomena. For example, women are typically used in submissive positions and popular representations in order to appeal to the male gaze, as described by philosophy professor A.W. Eaton as the sexually objectifying attitude that a representation takes towards its feminine subject matter, presenting her as a primarily passive object for heterosexual male erotic gratification. For a picture like this, it is meant to draw men in because the female body is shown in a sexual position and members of society are drawn to these depictions of sex, like that old comment that sex sells. But from my perspective, as a feminist scholar, I find it objectifying and offensive to the feminine body. Who we are and how we think directly affects how we receive information and images. In conclusion, 
The identity that we construct for others is based on the images and languages that we attach to them. In the following videos, I will rhetorically analyze the textual rhetoric of disability in the form of writing, the history of representation of disability, contemporary advertisements featuring disabled women's bodies for athletic brands, and advertisements for swimsuit and underwear brands. Through using the idea and theory of a stigmatizing normalized body that exists on a continuum of ability and disability, the bodies will be analyzed for discrimination based on their intersecting identities. Disability has been misrepresented as well as underrepresented in our media. We are not disabled or abled, but on a continuum, and the choices that we make in regards to representing disability directly affect us all. It matters.